Um, my name's Simon Wardley. I'm going to talk to you about crossing the river by feeling the stones. Um, I'm going to talk about something called mapping. Has anybody here heard or seen of my form of mapping before? Nobody? No one at all? Okay, so normally it takes about two days to explain this stuff. Um, we try to cram it into an hour. I've got approximately 45 minutes left to get you back uh, in time for your break. So before I start, whoops, clicker. Quick word of warning. Uh, I'm a scientist by training, uh, which means I like graphs. Uh, this is a, a graph, the level of audience pain. That's you against the number of slides given in an hour, now 45 minute presentation. I reckon there's a safe limit of about 90. <laughs> now, being a scientist, I like to experiment, so I'll be using no less than 208. I know what you're thinking, what the fiddlesticks is happening here, how quickly can I run to the door, but uh, as I said, I'm going to talk about mapping, so I'm going to start by giving you a map. I'm going to start off by talking about the concept of strategy within business, and then we're going to head south, I'm afraid. Uh, we're going to talk about the issue of situational awareness, we'll talk about how to map an organisation, why it might matter. Then we'll talk about patterns. And then at the very end, if we get time, we go on to a little magical mystery tour as well. OK. So this, uh, this conversation of strategy happened, uh, started for me in 1995. I was in the Arts Hotel in Barcelona, working for a, a company called Frisolet. And uh, uh, the vice president of Frisolet, or well, the SVP, handed me uh, a copy of the company's strategy document and said, what do you think? Now, I was young. Uh, I picked up this document. I leafed through the pages. It had words like innovation, efficiency. Uh, I hadn't got a clue what I was talking about. So I said, it looks OK to me. Uh, about 10 years later, I was the CEO of this company. It was an online photo service, not huge, millions of users. We had about 16 different lines of business, lots of revenue, very profitable. Uh, anyway, I was the CEO, and we had a, a strategy document, and it didn't make any sense to me whatsoever. So I handed it to somebody who worked for me and said, what do you think? And they sat there, and they leafed through the pages, and then they looked at me and said, looks OK to me. <laughs> so I had this moment, oh, OK. Um, so Fatango had a, had a problem. Uh, the problem was me. I was the CEO. This is uh, my fat cat representation of a CEO. The problem was I was the fake CEO. So despite the fact we were, had lots of revenue and were profitable, I had no idea what I was actually doing. So I wasn't the sort of chess-playing master that you read about in uh, HBR. I was more like this, the alchemist. It was all gut fill, you know, uh, meme copying others. Now, it didn't mean we didn't have vision statements. We had things like this, for Tango, our strategy is customer focus. We will lead an innovative effort uh, in the market through our use of agile techniques and open source. Uh, this was 2003. We'd adopted XP in 2000. Agile Manifesto came out, what, 2001? Do, do you all know extreme programming, things like that, XP? Yeah, good, right, super. Um, but the problem with this was I'd pinched it from other companies. Um, so I used to go around listening to other CEOs talking about strategy, and I would record the words they would use, the small words. Uh, and I would call them business-level abstractions of a healthy strategy, or blahs for short. Uh, I do this every couple of years. These are the common blahs from 2014. Uh, digital business, big data, disruptive, innovative, collaborative. If you did it today, you'd probably what, put AI in there, a bit of IoT, a bit of blockchain. You've got to have a bit of blockchain in, in here as well. Anyway, so I, I took multiple companies' strategy documents, combined them together, and came up with what I call a blah template. So our strategy is blah, we will lead a blah effort of the market through our use of blah to build a blah. <laughs> and then I just combined the blahs and the blah template and auto-generated 64 
random gibberish strategies. Things like this. Number one, our strategy is customer focus. We will lead a disruptive effort of the market through our use of innovative social media and big data to build a collaborative cloud-based ecosystem. Number two, <laughs> our strategy is innovative digital business. We will lead a, a growth effort of the market through our use of customer, oh, I can barely say the words, it's, it's that painful. So I sent these around to different companies and I got 400 odd responses of three basic types. The first type was, uh, this is the exact wording from our business plan. <laughs> uh, the second type was, uh, I've seen two of these used already. And my third and my favorite type was, are you for hire? <laughs> So anyway, a friend of mine's put this all online, by the way. This is strategy as a service. <laughs> so... <laughs> so if you ever need a strategy, you just type in the URL, uh, and it will automatically generate you one. This is from a few days ago. Our strategy is collaborate based on nothing whatsoever. And if you don't like it, it's really simple. You just press refresh. <laughs> Um, anyway, so there I was back in 2004 thinking, well, something's a bit suspect. I mean, we're, 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 revenue's growing, profitability's growing, we're doing really well, but, but I don't really understand what we're doing. So I went back to first principles. I started with Sun Tzu. Anybody know what Sun Tzu wrote? Art of War. Art of War. Super. So Sun Tzu talked about five factors that mattered in competition. First, understand your purpose, your moral imperative, your, your scope, why you are trying to achieve something. The next, understand your landscape, the environment you're competing in. Then you understand climatic patterns, so these are the things that are changing your environment, things you don't have control over. Then you understand doctrine, so universal principles of organization. And finally, you get into leadership, which is all about context-specific forms of gameplay. So I was quite excited by that, and then I came across John Boyd. Anybody know what John Boyd wrote? Uda. Um, so US Air Force pilot. So John Boyd, yeah, noticed you have the game, so your purpose. The first thing you need to do is observe the environment. That's what landscape and climatic patterns are around. Then you need to orientate around it. Uh, which is what universal principles and doctrine are about, and then you need to decide where you're going to attack and act. Now, I was quite excited by this, and I showed it to other people, and they said, ah, yeah, really, strategy is all about the importance of why. Well, that's an interesting idea, because there are two whys. There is the why of purpose, as in I want to build the best tea shop in in the UK, and the why of movement is why do I make this decision over that decision? And they are very, very different things. So if you think of a game of chess, your why of purpose might be to win the game. Your why of movement is do I move this piece or that piece? And it's through moving pieces that we learn. So one gains a positional advantage, uh, such as moving the pawn, whereas if you move the queen, it's checkmate. So you've got two different whys. So I went back to my online photo service, and I thought, right, well, let's see if we can apply this. This was um, late 2004. So I started going, what's our purpose? We want to be an online photo service, but we have 16 other lines of business, all very profitable as well. Um, so it's actually a bit of a mess. Uh, but how do we actually understand the landscape? And this brought me onto the subject of situational awareness, which is our next topic. Who has a military background? Hands up, roughly. Right, so those very few with a hand up. Um, how important is situational awareness in the military? Really important, right, super. For the rest of you, I'm going to explain it with three stories. Vikings, Chess, and Themistocles. So Vikings, very frightening people. This is how they used to navigate. From Hermann Head, uh, due west towards half, and you will have sailed north of Hatland, they used to use stories. You would learn your epic story before you set sail on a boat. Um, but that means that 
Okay? That's all it means, the story. So quick question, what would you use to navigate? A visual map or a verbal story? What would you use? I can't, shout out. GPS, I know that's just an advanced form of visual map, isn't it? Uh, so would you use a map or a story? Maps? Maps, stories? Really? Okay, fine. <laughs> Okay, so next example is chess world. I want you to imagine you live in a world where everybody plays chess, and how well you play this game determines your rank in this world. But no one's ever seen a chessboard. You play the game very simply, you see these characters on a screen, and what you do is you press a button, pawn, uh, your opponent sees what you've pressed, they counter, pawn, they see what you've pressed, so they counter, pawn, they see what you've pressed, they counter, Queen, and the game goes on for ages and ages until it's a draw or more likely, well, actually more likely it's a draw rather than somebody winning. <coughs> now what will happen is after hundreds of games, if not thousands, if not tens of thousands, we will take these sequences and stick them into our big data systems and come up with secrets of success. So if you press king, I should respond with knight and rook. And we'll write books on the secret of the, the queen, the secret of the knight, etc., etc. If you don't believe me in business, this is my favourite Harvard Business Review article. It's from November 2011. It's how earlobes can signify leadership potential. It's all about the phrenology of management. So uh, I don't know if you go around measuring CEO earlobes. Uh, I, I always think it's... Uh, it's a bit of a laugh, anyway. So, um, well, anyway, what will happen is one day you're going to play a game of chess against someone who will see something magical. They will see the board. So you've been playing the game for 20 years. You've got all your secrets of success and big data systems. They've been playing for a couple of days. So your press pawn, you know, that pawn moves. They'll counter pawn. Uh, your counter pawn. They'll counter queen, and you'll have lost. And the first reaction you'll have, other than what the fiddlesticks happen there, is to write down their, their sequence as though it's some sort of magic secret of success. How's that going to help you? Say again? It's not going to help you against this person. So, so, then, so then you'll go, oh, well, maybe it's the speed at which they press the button. How's that going to help you? No? So, so after desperation, you'll probably go, maybe it's cultural. Maybe they're a happy sort of person. You lose because you exist in what's known as a low-level situational awareness environment, and you will always lose. So what would you use to learn? Secrets of success or context-specific players described by a board or a map? The second one. What do we use in business? The first one. OK. When it comes to navigation, maps and stories, what do we use in business? Stories. stories. Oh, OK. Right, so, so the last uh, example of uh, Themis is Themistocles, ancient politician, Greek general, had a problem. The Persians were invading. Uh, what he decided to do was to block off the Straits of Artemisium, force the Persians along a narrow uh, pass uh, known as Thermopylae, where a small number of troops could defend against a larger force. There were about 4,000 Greeks made up of the various city-states, about 170,000, we reckon, Persians. In this 4,000 Greeks, there were 300 Spartans. Right, super. So I want you to imagine you're all members of the Athenian army, uh, the Athenian city-states, so you're part of the Greek army. It's the eve of battle. Themistocles is giving you purpose and moral imperative. And he says, we want to defend against the invading Persian hordes. Uh, but then he says to you, I do not understand the landscape. I do not understand the environment. I have no map, but have no fear, for I have created a SWOT diagram. <laughs> Strengths, a well-trained Spartan army, a high level of motivation not to become a Persian slave. Weaknesses, the E4s might stop the Spartans turning up. A truckload of Persians are turning up. 
opportunities, get rid of the, uh, the Persians, get rid of the Spartan, we're Athenian, we actually hate the Spartans, and threats the Persians get rid of us, and the oracle says a really dodgy film might be produced a few thousand years later. So quick question, what would you use to communicate and determine strategy in battle? Position and movement described by a map or a magic framework like a SWOT diagram. <laughs> Which would you use? Map. map, yeah, yeah. What do you use in business? Sorry? SWOT. Okay. So I'm going to go back to alchemy versus chess. Uh, if you look at the questions of navigation, learning, and strategy, then chess, it's all visual. It's context-specific. It's all about position and movement. It's what we call a high-level situational awareness environment. It's a bit like the military. Um, if you ask a general, why did they bomb a hill? A general won't tell you, you know, because I read an article in General Weekly, the bombing hills was an in thing. Uh, they won't say because these consultants gave me a report saying 67% of other generals are bombing hills. Uh, and they, they won't say because I thought it would make a good story. It's all about position and movement and, and where and why attack this space over that. Now, alchemy is all about storytelling, secrets of success, magic frameworks, uh, magic thinking. It's what we call a low-level situational awareness environment. And so that's where I was as this fake CEO. Uh, we are very profitable and everything else, but it was all stories, magic frameworks, no understanding of the landscape. Uh, but I used to say this to my friends who were CEOs of other companies, and they would go, but we're successful. Well, we were successful too. But the point about this is business is little more than a cat fight. And it's OK to be completely oblivious and blind to the environment and messing all this stuff up as long as everybody else is. As long as uh, no one gains an advantage, then everyone's OK. And there's a wonderful study by Fitzer which looks at the uh, variance of decomposition and impacts of CEOs, looks at the impact of CEOs. And, and what it determined after looking at tens of thousands is the impact of CEOs is, is pretty much negligible compared to random chance. So in 70% of the cases, you could literally get rid of them and just grab anyone off the street, and it would have no impact on the organization. Now, it's not a very popular study, um, but, but, but I think it's, you know, it's a great piece of work. Anyway, at this point, people get really angry with me and say we're not stupid. Uh, I'm, I'm saying understand the difference. I'm not saying people are daft. Uh, the problem is we don't have maps. So what is it about a map that makes it so useful? Well, maps have certain characteristics. They are visual, they are context-specific, the battle at hand, this is the Battle of Thermopylae, not the Battle of Waterloo. You have the position of pieces relative to some form of anchor. In this case, the anchor is a compass, so this is north, south, east, and west of that. And you have consistency of movement. So if I want to go from Athens to Thebes, which way would I go? Northwest. You wouldn't suddenly go, suddenly discover that one day that Thebes is south. Okay, um, but then people say we have maps. Well, I had things like this systems maps, we called them. Anyone seen a diagram like this? Yes? Good, right. So I'm going to take one of the boxes, Customer Relationship Management, CRM, uh, and I'm going to move it over here. How's that impacted that map? It hasn't, right. If I took an atlas of the world and I shifted Australia and put it next to, say, Lithuania, how does that impact the map? <laughs> Quite a bit. <laughs> okay, um, the problem is this is not a map. We call them maps, but they're not. But it's okay, because I have things like, like this. Anyone seen one of these? Yes, yes, business process. They're not maps either. Uh, then we have things like, anyone seen one of these, digital roadmap? Yes, yes. Uh, if I want to go from um, predictive analytic campaign to go through A-B testing, I have to go through the stations of mobile analytics, marketing analytics, social analytics, web content. It's just gibberish. Uh, but it's also not a map as well. 
So, so one of the problems with maps, um, well, you've seen one of these, my maps. Yeah? Do you want to have a guess? <laughs> yeah, they're not maps either. So, so we keep on using that word, but I, I, you know, it doesn't mean what we actually think it means, I'm afraid. So I needed to create a map. So how do I do that? How do I make a map of business? That was my problem. So I sat down and I had a cup of tea. And while I was having a cup of tea, I realized as a user I had a need for a cup of tea. And cup of tea has needs. It needs hot water, it needs tea. And hot water has needs. It needs kettle, it needs cold water. And a kettle has needs, it needs power. So what I've got is at the very top I've got an anchor, the user, and I've got position in a chain of needs relative to the user. So what I was able to do was take my systems diagram, I put the user at the top, and there can be many forms of users. There can be the public consumer, there could be uh, the business itself, there can be regulators. So I've, what I've got is the user need at the top, and then I've got a chain of needs underneath it, from that which is visible to the user to that which is invisible. So the user wanted things like photo storage. They didn't care what power or who actually produced our data center. This stuff was invisible. So what I've got is an uh, anchor and position. And that's a starting point, but it's still not a map. It's still useless on its own because I'm missing movement. So I took one thing, power, and power starts off with things like the Parthian battery, lots of arguments over when and precisely what it was used for, 400 AD. It evolves, you get things like the custom built examples like the Hippolyte Pixie, Siemens generators, eventually you get Tesla and Westinghouse, utility provision of electricity, 1886, and that marketing chap Edison as well. Well, evolution is changes movement. So if I can somehow describe evolution, that is the movement of things. So it took me about eight months, took about 9,000 data points, and this is what came up. If you look at the ubiquity versus certainty of an act, you start off with the genesis of novel and new things, custom-built examples, then products, rental services becoming more well understood, more widespread, uh, rental services, commodity and utility services. And that is simply driven by supply and demand competition. It's pretty basic. But what I was able to do was take my value chain, flatten that evolution curve at the bottom, Genesis custom-built product commodity, simply move things where they were, and that was the first map that I produced in 2005. And it's got all those components, anchor, position, and movement. It's actually a map. I was quite excited by that, but I showed other people and they went, so what? Why does that matter? Who cares? Well, the thing about a map is if you have a map of the environment, by simply observing it, you can learn patterns of change, rules of the game, context-specific forms of play. And that's what I'm going to show you with patterns here. I'm going to start off, you've got your purpose, you start getting a map so you understand the landscape, you start with climactic patterns. So these are the things that can impact your environment regardless of what you want to do. The rules of the game. The first one you discover is everything evolves. Doesn't matter whether it's money, penicillin, computing, electricity, if there is supply and demand competition, it shifts from left to right. The second thing you discover is characteristics change. So on the far side, in this uncharted space, it doesn't matter whether it's penicillin or money, it's chaotic, uncertain, unpredictable, exciting, and different. Over time, it evolves through a, a stage, a transitional set of characteristics, until eventually it ends up being industrialized, ordered, standard, stable, dull, boring. Now, this was good for me. Because what had happened is we'd introduced XP, uh, extreme programming, and by 2003, we discovered that Agile didn't work everywhere. 
Turns out XP, very lightweight, test-driven development, those sorts of mechanisms are very strong in this uncharted space because you're reducing the cost of change. But it turns out Six Sigma is very strong in the more industrialized because you're reducing deviation. Whereas in the middle, lean, lean, agile is very strong because you're focused on learning. So you start off in this world where it's all, you know, client and developers together, test-driven development, very lightweight. And now you're developing, you're getting things like a product owner, you're starting to introduce Kanban, uh, you're getting more formal uh, scrum, say, and uh, more formal KPIs, and eventually you end up with something like Six Sigma. So what you learn is there's no such thing as one size fits all. The next pattern that you learn is as things evolve, they become more efficient, they also enable higher order systems to appear. So things like electricity enables radio, lighting, television. Of course, that's all in this uncharted space. So it increases the speed at which we can build, but it's still highly uncertain. That's the effect known as componentization, Herbert Simon's theory of hierarchy. The more evolved the underlying components are, the faster it is for us to build higher order systems. Right, the next thing you learn is that higher order systems create new sources of value or worth. They're uncertain. You don't know what's going to be successful. Is it going to be the box in the corner of the room with fl flashing pictures? Or is it going to be the refrigeration blanket? What's happening is as things evolve, they expand the adjacent possible, but it's all highly uncertain. Um, these higher order systems, of course, evolve um, as they go along. So what happens? Parthian battery enables computing. That enables databases, enables AI. So what you get is a, a value chain which is constantly moving in this landscape. Has a past, has a future. The next thing you learn is the Red Queen. You don't have choice. So if you're competing against others and one evolves, they get the benefits of efficiency, speed, uh, worth. So it's more efficient and more easily able to create new higher order systems, more access to value. They create pressure on you to adapt. As more adapt, uh, you have no choice over it. You have to change. So you learn there's no choice over evolution. And the next thing you learn is we have inertia because of past success. So if I take somebody like Blockbuster Netflix, who was first with the website? Blockbuster, who was first with video ordering online? Blockbuster, who was first with experimenting with video streaming? Blockbuster, who went bankrupt first? <laughs> Blockbuster, they out-innovated the market. Why did they go? What took them down? Any ideas? Stores? What is it about stores that took them down? It was late fees. Do you remember late fees? Total silence. Do you remember video cassettes? <laughs> okay. So in my age, <laughs> we used to have these things called video anyway. It doesn't matter. Layout innovated the market but lost. All right. So the point about this, and there are 31 common economic patterns, of which most people are oblivious to the majority, you can use them to anticipate obvious forms of change. So in 2005, we had our map. We knew, knew things like platform compute was going to a utility. We knew it would have inertia. We knew it would enable higher order systems. And the point about that is it gave us multiple points that we could actually attack. Did I want to build the world's first compute utility platform uh, as a service, or maybe build something on top of those as they developed, or maybe I want to differentiate with my product? OK, now this brings me to doctrine, which is our second form of patterns that we have. So these are universally applicable principles regardless of context. So this stuff works um, everywhere. You have a choice over whether you want to do it or not, but it's a good idea to do it. So it's a bit like flanking versus firing. Flanking is context specific. You only flank an opponent when they're at a certain point. Firing, or knowing how to fire the gun, is universally useful. 
i.e. in the middle of a battle, you don't want to turn around to your soldiers and say, look, you better go off and learn how to fire the rifles now, because we now need to use them. It's a good idea to have done that before. So these are all the universally useful. So I'm going to start with the emergency services mobile communication platform, uh, infrastructure for communicating ambulances, fire, police. Um, so the first problem, actually I'll go back a slide, is when I asked them what's the user need, um, people would go point to a 300 page specification document and say it's somewhere in there. So what they did is they spent a, a morning uh, they started mapping. They first start with the user need. That's the stuff at the top. Um, and that's the first bit of doctrine that's useful. Know what your users actually want. The second one is actually to understand the details. So which is what they did, is they mapped it out, understand what components are involved in making this stuff happen. OK, so the next bit of doctrine is once you start having maps, so police, immigration, borders, you can share them, we start to discover that we have duplication uh, within systems. So often we build profile diagrams because we find we've got six re user registration systems, five are a commodity, one somebody's custom building because no one's ever built user registration before, and so what you start to discover is bias. How many of you have got a development background? Hands up. How many of you have built user registration? Hands up. Right, how many of you have built user registration more than five times? Hands up. Okay, quite a few. Okay, it's pretty common, actually. Uh, we like rebuilding exactly the same thing over and over. If you think government is bad, the worst duplication I've ever found in a government is 118 workflow systems doing the same thing, registering prisoners into prisons. We've rebuilt that 118 times. Um, the private sector always, always, it shows government up. When it comes to waste and bias, the private sector is our master. Um, in terms of, I've got a bank with a thousand risk management systems. So they're sitting there complaining they can't innovate because they built risk management a thousand times. I've got a pharmaceutical company, 380 teams building enterprise content management systems. They had a, um, oh, there's a nice echo going on. Can you hear that? Okay. Hello, hello. Sound echo. So, so they had um, a global architects meeting where, where um, they, they realized they had 380 teams, uh, sorry, 350 teams building enterprise content management systems. And one of the global architects said, don't worry, I'm building the global enterprise content management system. <laughs> to which one of the other architects said, hang on, we're doing that. They had five global efforts. Anyway, so duplication waste, if you think it's bad in government, Private sector, brilliant, fantastic. Anyway, so um, what happens? You start removing duplication, so that's pretty basic. Then you get to things like FIST, fast and expensive, simple and tiny. Heard of this? US Air Force, no? They used it for building the marine combat aircraft. Uh, that went from paper to combat operations in 18 months, fired its first shot in 19 months. It's pretty simple. What you do is you take your map and you break it down into small components. Don't treat it as one big thing. So uh, think about microservices. They're exactly the same approach. Now, this is how our contract was actually looking, which is a bit of a nightmare. Um, it's a bit of a nightmare because of this, the one-size-fits-all approach. And uh, to explain why, we'll talk about use appropriate methods. If you've got a map, of any complex system, HS2, high-speed rail, what you do is you build with agile in-house techniques here, off-the-shelf products here, Six Sigma outsource and cloud services here. And you do that all at the same time. Very basic. The problem with using a big approach, like having you know, a massive contract, is there is no one-size-fits-all across the lot of that. There is no one single method. And the best way of showing this is with this, the self-driving car. How many of you um, are work in finance? OK. So is it fair to say that a lot of L IT is elvish to people in finance? Yes? 
OK, so what I'm going to do is I've taken a self-driving car, a systems diagram for it, and I've translated it into Elvish um, so that we can all feel like we're part of finance. And so what I'm going to ask you is, should we outsource or build our own? Should we outsource or build our own? What do you think, A or B? <laughs> Both. <laughs> we make decisions like this all the time. I'm going to turn it into a map. I'll ask you the same question again. Should we outsource or build our own? Yeah. Outsource. outsource. Should we outsource or build our own? Build our own. It's simple, isn't it? Ridiculously simple. Um, anyway, most organizations, that's the map they have. They don't actually have one. And so what they tend to do is yo-yo. They do one-size-fits-all methods. Let's go all agile. Let's go all Six Sigma. Let's go all lean. Uh, and then somebody works out, something else works better over there, and then they do it all over again. Or they try and outsource everything. And when they outsource everything, what happens is the industrialized parts get efficiently treated, and the uncharted space incurs all the excessive change control costs, because you can't specify it and everything else. And then what happens is you get into a big fight with the vendor. They say it's all your fault because you didn't know what you wanted. You couldn't know what you wanted. But nonetheless, somebody on your, your side normally goes, next time we need to specify it better. Have you been there? Yes, it doesn't work. It just gets miserable. Okay. So, uh, you use appropriate methods, so you've removed duplication, you understand the user needs, you now think about small teams, small cell-based structures, um, then you start to discover that engineering over here is not the same as engineering over here, same with finance and marketing. So what you're doing is two pizza type approaches at Amazon, no team bigger than be fed by two pizzas or higher, cell-based structures. And then you start to realize you need different attitudes. So you end up with structures such as pioneers, settlers, and town planners. Uh, people are very good at creating this space. There are people who are brilliant at turning it into useful products. And then there are people who are brilliant at industrializing these components. And then you get into basically designing organizations which cope with constant change through the introduction of a system of theft. Anyway, I won't go through that because A, it's boring, it's 2005, it's 12 years old, and GCHQ, our intelligence services, has written a wonderful paper uh, which they've open sourced on how to organize and structure yourself around that. Just search GCHQ, boiling frogs, uh, and you'll find it. It's pretty straightforward. So, we understand our purpose, we start to understand our landscape and environment, we start to understand climatic patterns so we can anticipate, we get into orientating ourselves with doctrine, so we finally, at the end of this, get to the whole leadership bit. Which is pretty straightforward, this is all about the context-specific forms of gameplay. So this is the uh, flanking versus firing bit, so you have a map, and you can anticipate where it's going. So you can see there's multiple points that I might wish to attack. So what you do is you start to learn how do I manipulate this environment to my favor. So there's 31 common economic patterns, about 40 or different forms of doctrine. There's 70 different ways of manipulating the market. And most people are oblivious to this as well. So there's things like open approaches, open source, open data, open APIs, great for industrializing. You can slow things down with fear, uncertainty, and doubt. If inertia barriers exist, there's constraints. There's all sorts of ways you can manipulate. And so what you do is you come up with a context-specific form of gameplay which is what we did in Fatango in 2005. We knew that this was going to industrialize, so we decided to attack the platform space. We built the world's first ever serverless environment. Uh, it was JavaScript front and back end, functional billing. You didn't worry about the infrastructure. You just wrote code. We knew that people would build on top, so we could actually mine the ecosystem to spot new patterns. There was a whole play built around it, pretty straightforward. And so you, next is you act, which is, and you loop around the cycle. 
So acting is what we did. We launched Zimki, world's first serverless environment, 2005. This is us at Euro Oscon, 2006. We were pretty much the only tech company in Old Street, rapidly growing. Uh, this is our motto, pre-shade yaks. Anyway, it was rapidly growing, all very good. Uh, unfortunately, the parent company got a big American consultancy firm in, and they said the three things that we were doing uh, cloud, the use of mobile phones as cameras, and 3D printing were not the future. The future was, in fact, 3D television. And does anybody own a TV, a 3D TV? One. <laughs> Two. Right, three. Wow, the embarrassment. Uh, does anybody actually use it? No? All right, fair enough. Um, so then I went to... Uh, well, I decided to leave. Um, I joined a company called but, uh, Canonical, provides Ubuntu. Have you heard of Ubuntu? Yes. yes, right, fantastic. So, 2008, we map it all out. We use the maps to work out where we're going to attack. Uh, I map out Microsoft Red Hat, identify points of inertia within them. We spent about half a million, uh, 18 months. This is where we were, about 2 3% of the operating system market. This is 18 months later. 70% of all cloud computing. Does anybody remember that time where it was all Microsoft Red Hat, Microsoft Red Hat, and then about a year and a bit later, it was just all Ubuntu? Yes? Anybody from Red Hat here? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> anyway, that was great fun. I thoroughly enjoyed that. And then, and then I wrote something called the Better for Less paper for UK government, which helped in the transformation. And this was for Francis Maud. I wrote this with Liam Maxwell and others, which helped in the transformations in 2010, helped in the formation of something called GDS, Government Digital Services, and most importantly, spend control. Uh, and that, uh, you know, um, they use mapping and that's had some big impact. I mean, this is one project they've saved 450 million on. Um, we've had lots of good examples like that. Uh, so these days, most of the stuff I do mapping is actually nation state competition, not even individual systems. It's like China versus USA and all those sorts of things. Anyway, my normal response at this time is people go, ah, oh, this is complex. Well, actually, um, it's not really. Uh, uh, the, the problem is familiarity. You know, we joked about you would use a map here. A map's far more complex than a SWOT diagram. Uh, and the problem is we're used to the idea of maps in most activities. In, in business, um, that's what we're familiar with. That's why we tend to, to rely on, on, on things like SWOT diagrams. Anyway, uh, so quick summary. Um, strategy is a cycle, very simple. <coughs> Uh, it's important to act. Uh, acting is an important part of the process of learning. Uh, it's also important to understand the landscape. If you don't understand the landscape, you can't learn climatic patterns, you can't learn doctrine, how to organize yourself, you can't learn context-specific play. You're all about guesswork. And of course, it's also important uh, to run around the cycle. Every time you move around the cycle, you get better at playing this game. So. Uh, that's what crossing the river by feeling the stones is all about. It's about understanding direction and purpose, feeling your way as you go along, understanding the landscape and learning from the landscape with every small move you make. And at that point, I'm going to say thank you and just mention that this is all Creative Commons, has been for over a decade, so, so please help yourself. Thank you. So I've got four minutes left. Uh, we can either go into the danger zone, well, you can either Q&A or you could leg, run out, or um, I can take you on a bit of a magical mystery tour uh, where we've got subjects like co-evolution, which is serverless, uh, we, we've, and Brexit down the bottom, but we won't get that far. <laughs> Do you all understand why serverless is really important? Yes? Anybody here not understanding why serverless will take over their entire world and why DevOps is the new legacy? <laughs> so you all understand that? Ah, uh, okay, very, very quickly then. Compute. When compute was a product, 
Um, so servers, do you remember servers? Because I know some of you had problems with video cassette recorders. Uh, <laughs> do you remember servers? Right, okay. So we built applications built on emerging architectural practice for servers. And the characteristic of a server was high MTTR, high mean time to recovery. So when the server went bang, it would take you weeks to get a new one. Anyway, what happened is those practices evolved and became best practice for that world. So they used to be things like scale up, N plus one, disaster recovery test. Do you remember that? Yes. yes, good, right, super. So we used to laugh at people who hadn't done their capacity planning. You know, your email server ran out of space, <laughs> and all that sort of thing. Anyway, what happened is compute evolved and became a utility. Of course, naturally, we gave it a dreadful name. We called it cloud. And that led to basically a co-evolved practice. So rather than it's based upon a different change of characteristic, not high MTTR, but low MTTR. So when your server goes bang, now it takes you seconds to create a new one. So what you've got is a new set of practices, not scale up, but scale out, distributed systems. Those are evolving, and we gave them a dis distributed systems chaos engine, design for failure, uh, things like uh, continuous deployment, because it doesn't take weeks, it takes seconds to set up new architecture. A new tribe formed, and eventually, we, after several years, we gave, gave them a name. We called them DevOps. Okay, and that's continuing to evolve to now, these days, we've got applications built with best architectural practice for a product world, that is legacy, and applications built with good evolving to best architectural practice for a utility world, and that is, that is cloud and DevOps. Does that make sense? Good, right, I've still got two minutes left, so I'll get through this. Anyway, so what happened is uh, people gave up worrying about earlobes. They started talking about how cloud can signify leadership potential. And, and a lot of CEOs run around saying, make my legacy cloudy. <laughs> to which they stuck their legacy onto things like Amazon. Amazon would have an outage, and then people would run around saying the end of cloud is nigh. Do you remember that? And you'd go, should now architecture evolve as well? And they would go, burn him, heretic, uh, all those sorts of things, OK? And they did that because basically they had inertia created by past success with those practices around products. That's all. Uh, and of course, vendors would dive in, take advantage. What you need is an enterprise cloud. Uh, roll in the enterprise cloud. I want all the benefits of volume operations and commodity components built with non-commodity hardware customized to my needs. Aye, laddie, but you cannot change the laws of physics. I mean, it was just all just gibberish. But nonetheless, people spent billions on this, so good on them. Anyway, so that was the, the, the infrastructure space. It's now happening with platform. So we're shifting from a world of uh, a product stack uh, with things like LAMP.net to much more of a utility stack with Lambda and functional billing. And what you're going to see is a, is a co-evolved practice. Naturally, we've given it a lousy name, serverless, and we don't even have a name yet for the practices, so people just call it Jeff at the moment until someone comes up with a sensible name, and that's the combination of finance and development. And that's what's happening uh, at this moment. So that's where you should be investing, here and up here. And of course, it's forming a new tribe. And of course, you're going to get inertia from the past coding practices and, and of course, the DevOps crowd. They're going to create inertia. But if you run around telling people, you know, DevOps is the new legacy, they, they just give you all the sort of burn him heretic, <laughs> uh, which we had in the past, I'm afraid. Uh, there, there is this idea that DevOps is going to somehow teach the new serverless crowd. Um, it's a bit like DevOps and ITIL. DevOps inherited a heck of a lot from ITIL, things like iterative processes, focusing on users, using small components. But it's like the child. It goes, no, I have nothing to do with you, parent. I didn't inherit anything from you. I'm completely different. Well, the same is going to go on with uh, serverless as well. Uh, the new crowd is just going to reject DevOps anyway. It'll inherit, but it'll deny that inheritance. Anyway, there's lots more we could talk about, but I have overrun. So at this point, I'm going to say tribe's got a tribe, and thank you very much.